Two names are as famous in the world of computers as Google. Google has established itself over the last 10 years as the world's leading internet search engine. It also provides several other features like photographs, email, maps and Google Earth. Last year its income was a staggering $17 billion, that's nearly £10 billion. Yet few people know how it operates or have ever seen its headquarters. Google operates from a complex of buildings which they call their campus in Silicon Valley, California, about an hour south of San Francisco. Here its staff, known as Googlers, manage the global operations and come up with new ideas. About three years ago, Google adopted an active program of green initiatives at their global headquarters. It's really a commitment from our co-founders and our CEOs and our exec executives wanting to show a very physical commitment to the environment, but to also understand the options of renewable energy for our offices. It starts with transporting employees to and from the Google campus every day. We actually provide free shuttles, um, which in and of itself removes cars off the road, but now we fuel those shuttles with uh, biodiesel. So we've reduced the diesel particulate emissions from our vans, but we've also just physically removed cars off the road because we have thousands of Google riders riding these free shuttles to and from work. Google also incentivizes people to purchase their own um, fuel-efficient vehicles. So if you, if you buy a hybrid, you'll actually get a cash rebate from Google for it. We also incentivize people to bike to work, so you basically can earn points every day you bike, and Google will donate a certain amount of money to your favorite charity, depending on how many points you have. Um, so there's really a lot of opportunities to contribute in your own way um, through your normal lifestyle. But Google has gone a step further. They actually have electric, non-polluting cars on site at the campus, which employees can use completely free of charge. So this is one of our plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. Um, we took traditional Toyota Priuses and converted them into um, hybrid electric vehicles. So it has both a gas engine and it's an electric vehicle both. These vehicles are charged by our solar um, panels in the carport, so they're completely off the grid. Um, we just plug them in. You just pull down one of these cords. Give it a little more slack than that. And we actually have done a demonstration project with our utility company to show that the batteries can store energy on the cars and later that energy can be put back into the um, utility grid. So instead of a turning ignition, it just has a little button. That's true on all Priuses. And of course it doesn't make any noise when, it, when you start driving it. The electric engine can reach speeds of 90 miles per hour and is extremely fuel efficient but the faster you drive, the more quickly you use up the electricity. If it does run out of juice, then it just switches over to a regular um, traditional engine. Another major green initiative that Google has adopted is the use of solar power at their campus. We're sitting amongst uh, 9,200 PV panels that make up the largest commercial solar installation in US history. Google took a bold step uh, over a year ago creating solar panels on seven different rooftops and two different carport structures to build what is now uh, carrying about 30% of the total load of this campus. Well, the electricity from our solar panels offset about 30% of our electricity demand here at these buildings where they're installed. So not Google's operations worldwide, but for the buildings that they're on top of. Uh, if there happened to be a lull in the workforce and they weren't drawing as much power and we created excess power, the power would flow back onto the grid and the meter here would actually literally run backward. We've seen it happen many times. It does work like that. And when you add all those together, these solar panels will pay back in about seven and a half years, which is a reasonable time frame. Um, not bad for an economic investment. So they actually will pay back. The challenge, you know, I think solar's had historically, it is an expensive technology and people have to decide for themselves whether it's going to be worth it to make that initial upfront investment. The major thing that's needed is technological innovation um, by making it easier and cheaper to manufacture it and to install it um, and in various other ways reducing the, the cost. 
Overall, Google sees its green initiatives as not simply a matter of economics, but hopefully is setting an example to others. Google's approach to sustainability is to continue to green our own operations through our offices, our data centers, the electricity that we use here, um, but we also want our successes to scale out to the rest of the world. So we're not just doing this for us, we're, we're really doing it for the future and to the options that we have available to us, we want to make sure are available to others. Um, for example, our solar project that we installed here, the real message was that not only can we do this right now, we can do it in a cost-effective way, which means that anyone else can do it too. The Golden Gate Bridge spans one of the most impressive bays in the world and is gateway to the great city of San Francisco. Near the bridge is Golden Gate Park, an urban open space of over a thousand acres where San Franciscans can relax and enjoy themselves. Since 1916, a famous natural history museum has stood in the park, the California Academy of Sciences. But in 1989, the building was severely damaged by an earthquake. And today, the Academy is reopening in an amazing new building with a strong emphasis on sustainability. This is really a very unique building because it's not just a natural history museum. It's a natural history museum, an aquarium, a planetarium, and a scientific research and education center all under one roof. When you come into the building, there's a large space with its roof open to the elements. To the left, the white walled dome houses the planetarium. Next to the planetarium is an artificial coral reef, which is 25 feet deep. We are standing on top of our Philippine coral reef exhibit. It is the deepest living coral reef display in the world. And we actually grew all of the coral for this exhibit in a coral nursery. So we were able to create this exhibit in a very sustainable way. On the opposite side from the coral reef, contained within the glass dome, is another feature designed to encourage awareness of sustainability. It's a real tropical rainforest, artificially created and preserved. The Rainforest of the World exhibit allows you to walk through a living rainforest and as you circle up through the ramp, you get to experience rainforest from different parts of the world. So you start in Borneo, you circle up into Madagascar, you circle up again into Costa Rica. It's a really amazing chance to experience four different rainforests all within an hour long visit to this dome. While the dome is kept at constant temperature and humidity, it's kept at 82 degrees and about 75% humidity. And we have a misting system in here that helps keep the humidity up. And we have skylights in the dome that were positioned to get the maximum amount of natural sunlight down into this exhibit to help the trees grow. So those skylights are helping to keep the exhibit warm, almost like a greenhouse. The building contains 38,000 live animals, including 4,000 fish in the coral reef. So we're hoping that we can start a lifelong process of caring about the natural world that starts with and experience that people had here in this building. Perhaps the most extraordinary feature of this already extraordinary building is its roof. The main architect of the building was the famous Italian Renzo Piano, one of the world's leading architects. His San Francisco partner Gordon Chong explains Renzo's concern to make the building fit in with the park. What Renzo talked about, which I find very exciting and, and interesting, is he says that if you think about a park and that the fact is you want to minimize the disturbance to that open space, he suggested taking a knife and cutting out that green footprint out of the park and raising it up 38 feet in the air into the tree line. To further integrate with the park, Renzo decided to create a living, breathing, organic landscaped roof planted with native California grasses and flowers. 
It has also been designed to blend in with the wider San Francisco landscape. The relationship of the building to the park, as you'll begin to see, is the fact that these mounding forms in great part reflect the existing natural landscape as well as the terrain of San Francisco behind us. The really major advantage of the roof, however, is that it's extremely green. It will absorb about two million gallons of rainwater every year. Much of this contains pollutants from the atmosphere, which would otherwise end up in San Francisco's water system. The landscape roof also provides natural insulation. That soil provides a significant insulation value that, that keeps the building both cool as well as warm where needed. There are a lot of things about green building that really go back to elemental things that might not seem like they're cutting edge, but they don't get done very often today. A couple of them are the use of natural light, the use of natural ventilation. It's very unusual to walk into a natural history museum and see all of this light filling the space. They're, they're typically very dark, sort of cloistered spaces. This is the unmuseum in many ways. You walk into this building and light is just flooding the hallways. We're just using natural resources. We're using fresh air and we're using natural sunlight. It may not seem like these are very complicated things, but 90% of our publicly accessible spaces have access to natural daylight. That's a staggering number. And there's no air conditioning on the public floor. The building is entirely ventilated by natural ventilation systems. As you know, there is a landscape roof that, that uh, undulates. The wind blows over and under and over, and as it goes through those mounds, it sucks air up, because as you know from the interior, the hot air will rise, and the wind blowing over the top of the roof will then pull that air out naturally with no mechanical ventilation. A facade, or the skin of the building as we refer to it, changes in response to the outside environment. So as shading is required on a sunny day, shades will move up and down by sensors. The edges of the building, as you'll see, provide uh, photoelectric cells. There are weather vanes at the top of the roof of the building that gives a computer all of the data necessary to tell them when skylights need to be opened. It's like a body, it breathes and it changes in response to what's happening to the exterior of, of the environment. Buildings have been evolving over the last 35 to 40 years in a very wonderful and, and appropriate, socially responsible kind of a way. But probably the most encouraging part of wh what's happening today is that the public is demanding this. The new California Academy of Sciences building, then, is a revolutionary model of how a public building can be made sustainable. It also provides one of the most exciting examples in the world of how buildings may evolve in the future.